All right, guys. So we'll keep it. I don't know. Are you guys really interested in hard money, or just here, kind of getting some credits? You know. I don't think we need credits. Don't need credits. Okay, cool. So, what brings you guys in the room then? Uh, what, like, why here? Why do you want to learn about the private funding? Are you guys? Do you guys deal in real estate investments at all, or now? Yeah. Um, and I'm, my bias is always to um, steer away from hard money because it seems too expensive. Right. Um, granted, I, I I haven't done all the math on if I'm only using funds for a few months, but sure. whether that's worth it or not. And, sure. Um, um, I want to learn more about that as an option. Like, okay. You know, where it makes sense, and you know, it sounds to me like the speed adds a lot of value. Yeah. Um, you know, which accounts for some of that cost. You have been watching my videos. Perfect. So that's, that's about the summary of all of them. So, um, but yeah, so hard money, honestly, like um, everybody has kind of like a predetermined notion as to what it may or may not be. Um, the simple version of it, if you're just dealing with like a, a pure hard money lender, which is what we're considered, is um, it's literally like somebody, you go up to somebody, say, hey, can I borrow some money out of your friend's bank account, your mom, dad's bank account, whatever. They say yes. They put a first lien against the property and now here's the money. That's as complicated as it really needs to be. That simple. Um, everybody tries to fancy it up and dial it up. And um, a lot of that integral work and the in-depth work of it honestly has to do with the source of funds from the company you're probably working with. So our company is all privately funded. We don't have, it's friends, families, partners, money. It's not uh, institutionally backed, which is different. And that's kind of where you run into those you know, you, you talk to like a broker or something and they say, hey, send me that lender matrix. And then you're just like, what are all these numbers? Like, what does all this mean? Um, it's not really pure hard money. What has happened over the past few years is that um, because interest rates are so low, historically low, um, banks found it sexy to be in the hard money space. So they said, let's put a sign up, call it hard money, but let's get our bank money in behind that and um, collect a huge spread. Right. So you're, you're doing 12 or 16 percent interest or whatever it is. Banks are out at three. I mean, they're making great money. It's a short term cash grab for banks and they'll all fall out of the, the space probably sooner than later, for sure, because interest rates go up and they go, oh, it's not sexy anymore. They leave. The problem with that, going to what you were talking about or asking about um, your understanding of hard money, is that you really are still being underwritten by a bank when they're institutionally funded, meaning you're going to be sending your W-2s, your tax returns, you're going to have all these fancy APR terms and all this stuff. So it's not really what hard money really truly was back in the day. In fact, back in the day, it was like a couple of guys in the mafia say, hey, let's, let's lend some money. So, and then if they like you, they give you the money. They don't, they don't give you the money. So um, we're, we're true private money. So we don't need any of that bank stuff. Like um, we don't need appraisals. I don't need W-2s. I don't need tax returns. You know, likely I'll have 10 or 15 people that send me deals by the time we're out of here and I'll go home or I'll go to the office, I'll underwrite them and tell you, hey, I can do the deal and I can close tomorrow. Um, or I don't like the deal and I'm out. So um, we'd really try to keep it simple. It's mainly used for fix and flip. I have a lot of other clients that use them for like bridge loans. Like they might say, hey, I'm buying like a shopping center or a commercial piece. And they say, you know, can I, can I gap this with your money? Sure, if the asset makes sense. Or, you know, I have a rental property that I'm going to refi out within 12 months. And I look at it and go, sure, it makes sense. Um, I can tell you, though, we are substantially less based on the borrower than the deal. Because um, most, and you'll know when you kind of bump into a company like mine or a company like the institutional funding, that they're going to end up, um, as soon as they start asking you for those W-2s and those tax returns, and you're like, is this deal based? Or is this, you know, how much paperwork am I submitting? Um, with us, it's just three things. I don't need an appraisal and I'll make a decision today on it kind of thing. We have many a times closed in 24 hours or less on deals that somebody goes, Hey, I got to close this tomorrow. And our office is situated in a, in a position to be able to move that quickly. And it's great. So, um, but that's really, I think one of the things you always want to ask yourself when you're looking at hard money for your next investment property is, um, you know, how well suited is the lender for me rather than the cost or the product itself. Cause it's all going to be about the same similar feel like, right. So let's say my money is 12% somebody else's is 14%. Well, that's about 1% a month is what that's going to run. Right. So a hundred thousand dollars, a thousand dollars a month at 12%. 
at 14%, you know, you're $1,140 a month, right? So it's about $140 difference. The 140 bucks a month is not going to be the difference between um, the make or break end of it or 1170 a month. So the make or break becomes how fast can your lender get you draws out? A draw typically is the disbursement of construction funds when you're when you're renovating something. Or, you know, how fast can they close? How easy are they to get a hold of? Like, are they on top? Are they easy to communicate with? Those are the questions you need to decide more so than the price war. Um, I find that clients, I have a lot of clients that, you know, if there's money out there that's cheaper than mine. They're just like, I'm just not dealing with them. I'd rather just pay a couple extra bucks and deal with you because they know on their end that if I'm fast and I get them their money, they can close quickly and get out of the loan, right? So they might be able to get out of a loan with me in say three months because of the speed of our back end office versus the other company they were dealing with might have take, lagged them up and taken five or six months. Well, that little 140 bucks just turned into thousands of dollars more because the other company would have lagged them. So what's up, man? Good to see you. How are you? Doing? Good. See you, bro. Hey, back from uh, New Orleans? Yeah, thanks, man. No, hey, John. 48 to recover. 40, yeah, that's like Vegas. That's like a Vegas yeah. trip. Hurry up. Hurry up. So that's the uh, so that's the gist of like the speed when you're dealing with a hard money lender and the difference of what you really want to um, look at. Those are the questions I always find people want to find are the most important relative to the product they're dealing with. Can you talk a little bit about the schedule of fees and the percentages and what's up front, what's... So you really shouldn't, so if you're bumping into anything up front, um, you're gonna end up in a position where you're probably dealing with a broker, which is okay, there's space. So in our world, so in your world, agents and brokers are, are like flipped in my world. So a broker, I, I would be considered like in your world a broker. So I'm considered a direct lender, meaning it's our money. Um, a broker then brokers the deal to us because they're sourcing to try to find my money. Whereas in like an agent, you know, you're an agent, then you have your broker that kind of oversees the agent. So it's actually flipped in our world. So what, if anything up front? No. Like if you get a, like an application fee or something, well, I don't want to say no, but I it, guess I, uh, hmm. so I don't start paying until I've drawn the money. There's no, Oh, oh, on an ongoing basis. As soon as you initiate the loan, as soon as the lien is placed against the property, let's say you go, all right, Ian, I need to close tomorrow. Great. We put a first lien against the property. You've signed the loan docs. Um, 30 days out usually is your first payment, interest only payment against that note. So if you're asking about like rolling everything in or no money down, is that what you're asking? I'm asking, so I've never bought a hard money. And right. I'm wondering from a beginner's perspective, what should I expect? Um, is the only num is the only cost I should be thinking about the interest rate? So, um, the, the, the ongoing. so there's, we call them junk fees in our world. It's just, it's what it is. So, and every mortgage company has them. So I'm not going to be very transparent about it with you. So they, um, junk fees are going to be considered just fees that you're like, what are these? And it's just like, cause we can, you know, I don't know what else to say. Um, you typically have like a funding fee or an origination fee, which is, so some companies like to disguise the cost of their money within those fees. And we just decided that we were just going to keep those fees low. So it's not like, Hey, what is this? When you get to the closing table, it's very, you know, obvious as to what it is. And we just keep it lower than the rest. So, um, but you're gonna have an origination fee, which I've seen as high as $5,000, which if you have a hundred thousand dollar deal, that's five extra points that you just pay. It, well, usually it is. So you have points. So it's usually like two to eight points is what you see. So that's, points or percentages. So if, so if you were to come to me and say, how much is your money? I'd say two and 12 or 14 and four. Like that means 14% annualized four points. So it's a fancy way of saying four extra percentage points that you pay at closing. It's usually built into the loan. But then you have an origination fee, which uh, most companies will have. And that's, you know, I've seen that as high as four or $5,000, which is, you know, uh, it sucks because I know how that probably plays out for people. Probably what happens is they go, oh, I'm getting 2% money and or 12% money and, and two points. And, th and then they go to close and they say, hey, send me the HUD. And they go, what is this $5,000 fee? Well, now we're like three days out. They have to close. They're probably really mad. You know, we just choose not to do business like that. We're like, we'd rather just tell you everything right now up front um, of what's there. And if you like it, great, let's go. Like, no surprises. Surprises are bad for everybody. It leaves a bad taste in the mouth. So. Yeah, that origination fee, um, you'll see, you usually have like a, le a legal 
doc prep, meaning your att the attorneys are prepping the docs. Um, very, very realistic fee. You'll see that uh, ours is extremely cheap, but um, you'll see that anywhere is a 1500 to 2500 probably is pretty common in that for a legal fee. Yeah. And then um, typically you're going to end up paying for an appraisal for most companies. We don't do appraisals. I have an inspector go out, but he'll charge to go look at it. But I don't I don't wait back on an appraisal. That's the other function is a lot of times people are sweating when they're dealing with um, institutional funding because the institutional funding needs the appraisal. Right. They don't. So my background in this business is I had I started as an investor 10 years ago, built a wholesaling company, built a property management company, sold it to Grob and Ben. And, you know, I have two partners in private money lending. So I've always been an investor. So that's why I can underwrite the deals that I look at um, as opposed to I don't care what an appraisal is going to say. In fact, nothing against appraisers. There's some really good ones out there. But, I, you know, very often their number is a lot different than mine. And I trust my experience in doing thousands of deals over uh, somebody else that I don't know. So that factor is is huge, waiting for an appraisal and they come back and they go, you thought it was gonna be a hundred grand higher or lower and then it blows up your whole deal. So back to what you were asking about fees and so forth. Um, those are the kind of things that you bump into. Uh, they're gonna be on every HUD. They're gonna be on every every company. It's probably a good question you wanna ask the company you're dealing with before you go down the road. So I'm, I'm speaking for myself, I actually, I mean, I came here to learn about hard money, but specifically your, your you. Oh, okay. Your business, like what would it cost uh, to do business with you? Yeah. Um, so the cheapest money that we typically have out there is about 13% and three points. That's from my experience. Like um, normally we're going to be 14 and four. Um, once upon a time, we were 15 and five back in 2008 and people couldn't they, they, we couldn't give enough money out at that time because there was no money on the streets. Um, but you know, that's what, it, and then with us, the other junk fees and stuff that I was talking about are very minimal compared to what you're going to run into. So I don't know when you average out the other companies and ours, if like the cost is like if they're more or we're more, I don't know, honestly, or I'm sure it depends on the deal size too. That probably plays a pretty big factor. Um, the, the, yeah. the bigger the deal, the better the, no, no. The bigger the deal, the more that would influence how many points or the origination fee or, or whatever, how much it'll slate those terms. But yeah, I mean, you know, if it's close, like like if somebody comes in, let's say I'm like $10,000 better than somebody on a $100,000 deal, you're probably going to want to work with me. Um, let's say I'm $10,000 worse. It's probably worth exploring the other company. Um, but when you're like within a couple grand one way or the other, and it's just like, this works out to about the same number. And if they're easier to deal with, I'd rather just deal with them. Just go with that company. I always, uh, I always recommend dealing with the company that you feel is going to keep you most liquid and easiest to deal with. And you want to, and I'm not just saying this because it's me, because in fact, if somebody else is watching this on a video, I'm going to say, you know, I lend in my market. You want to have a lender in your market. I find the deals that I end up closing the most, um, that from other lenders are the ones that are out of state. So if like, if you're in California and you're watching this video, I'm not for you. Like, I'm not going to be able to help you like somebody locally can. I always recommend that when you have a private lender that they're local because, um, it, so West coast money is notoriously cheaper than East coast money, meaning that the, it's just the way it is. The dollar signs are bigger. They're very used to like nine, 10% interest. And then they tell you they're going to close their deal out here where it's like 12 to 18% interest. And I can't tell you how many California, lending or Texas lenders fall out and I have to pick up the pieces to make sure the deal gets done because they don't know the market. They don't know what they're, you don't know who you're dealing with. Um, so it really helps to have a, a localized presence. We have some, I mean, there's a similar concern on an institutional level as well. Like not having a local lender, even, um, it's always better than dealing with the Bank of America and most part of On the retail level? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. You're, you know, it's easier to, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know which banks you guys normally deal with, but like, yeah, when you have a bank that Abington savings or whatever that is, whatever that bank is, that's localized, you know, that the presence is comfortable here as opposed to on mailing Washington. I got to wait They're on West coast time and we got a closing today and their, their closing department just shut the whole thing down. You know, like, I, yeah, I mean, so I usually, you know, I deal on the investment end, but then our loans flip, right? So I'm constantly dealing with traditional money as well, like you guys, because our loans have to close out. So I hear some bizarre stuff too. Like, I, I'm just like, you know, do you guys want them? I, I had a, uh, I'm not going to say which company this was, but it was just a week ago. It was 
bizarre because I'm literally saying, you know, hey, we submitted it. I guess the borrower submitted the deal. They accidentally checked financing instead of cash. There was T minus X amount of hours left. And I'm saying, I'm emailing the, the head of their support saying, I don't wait to submit this. They had to resubmit it as cash or as financing as opposed to cash. It was going to take three days. They're going to try to penalize the borrower, you know, $200 per diem. I was like, I'm, I will wire you the money tomorrow morning. What? And they're just like, it's the borrower's fault. It's this, it's that. I'm like, man, like when you, when you run into those kind of complicated departments in any kind of funding or any kind of institutional end, it just causes red tape that you don't want to deal with. And you definitely don't want to have the person that's supposed to be funding for you having those kind of complications because um, you've already got enough of a fight on the other end to deal with, likely. So. Can you mention that the majority of or all of the fees are usually wrapped up in super loans? Well, they're going to be on the HUD, right? But you're still going to bring a certain amount of cash to close. Like no money down doesn't really exist anymore. Um, but I mean, you, it can, let me back up. You can do no money down investing. Um, with our company, though, it's going to be with you're going to have to have other properties free and clear that you can encompass in the note. Um, but you're, I don't know any companies at all that you can just walk up and say, hey, can I do 100 percent? If you get if you get that, be careful. You're probably going to be calling me because they're going to fall out of closing. So is there a difficult percentage of um, on a good deal? I usually see like 15, 20 percent cash to close. That's pretty common. Can vary anywhere though within that range. I, every deal is literally different, but that that usually when I'm at 15, 20 percent cash to close, meaning you need 100 grand, I put up 80. 100 covers renovation and construction altogether. We're in at 100. Um, it usually means that I see a good deal with you. And a lot of people use uh, a lot of my best clients. Typically, I had a guy this morning. He goes, you know, we just haven't been con connecting on deals, meaning I don't see the same after repair value that he sees. And the after repair value being the potential renovated value. But that's usually how I'm basing my numbers. And he got mad at me, I guess. And he said, well, thanks. I'm never going to send you a deal again because my cat, his cash to close was so high. And I'm like, man, if I agreed to this, I got you into this deal, which is a bad deal. I said, your AR, you don't know your ARV here, but if it was a bad deal, all you're going to do is lose your shirt. So like, it's, <laughs> I'm thinking instead of a thank you for like, hey, I appreciate that. You know, he's like, I'm never sending you a deal again. I was like, my best borrowers, my best clients, um, the most experienced ones that stay in the game, they understand that I'm, I'd love to do a deal with you. I'd love to, but I'm going to do it, making sure that we protect the money for both me and you first. And so then when we see eye to eye, they might send me five, six deals. And then when we see eye to eye, there's about that 20% range in terms of cash to close. They know I'm saying in code words, hey, we're, we're on the same page um, as opposed to you know, if you see a big amount of cash to close, like the deal this morning I looked at, I think it was like all in was like a hundred grand he needed. And I was at, he needed like 80 or something. He needed like, he needed like the same amount he needed for me. It was like 40%. He thought, for, yeah, he goes, well, my ARV is, you know, 200. I go too bad. It's 140. Like you're so far off. And the problem with that is that you're going to lose everything. So I'm like, we just avoided a bomb for you yeah. is what it is. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so <clears throat> I've gone through your website quite a bit and I've oh, nice. worked with that uh, calculation sheet. Okay, yeah. Um, is it possible for someone to defer the payments altogether with, let's say it's a six month project, potentially in eight months? Mm. Can someone defer the payments so they're just paying, let's say, either real estate tax uh, or just insurance and uh, you know, they just accumulate and you pay it at uh, the sale? So we do, um, so it's like a JV structure where we put up all the money essentially, because I, I mean, what I could do with you is you could say, Hey, can I roll in eight months of payments? And I could go, sure. But what you're also you're going to see is that the cost of cash that you have to bring to the table just went up by the equivalency of eight months of payments. So it's the same offset. So if you're already bringing 20% cash to close and then you go, can I roll in eight months of payments? I'm literally just going to put those eight months of payments on the HUD and you can just pay them up front as opposed to paying them in the back. Well, it's more an issue of, um, you know, cash flow and, and you know, carrying costs. So it's okay. I have some clients that prefer it. Um, they prefer to do what you're saying. Um, in regards to like the type of deal structure where it's like a strictly like a split, like um, we put up everything or majority of it and you, um, you know, source the deal. That is like a JV structure. And we've, I've done those where we put up joint venture. And essentially what we're doing or the people we do it with are typically people we've done deals with and we understand the business working relationship with them because really we're taking on a business partner. 
whether they, it's not just, hey, we'll give you the money and go. It's like, we're in this together together right now. Um, so we've got like established relationships with people that they're like, hey, you want a JV on this one? The truth is though, the reality is if we're taking more risk, we're also gonna make more money. So it's usually cheaper for the borrower to just do a traditional style loan, but for carrying costs or liquidity purposes, or if a deal is that strong and they wanna do it, um, yeah, I mean, we can put up 100%. It's just gonna cost you a little bit more than it would have in the event that you, um, you know, wanted to do this in the traditional manner, but it's, it's certainly possible. What about um, funding like the construction projects, the whole thing? Yeah, we do that. that, right. So a typical deal, so sometimes the two that I see the most common would be you buy the property outright cash and then you go, hey, I need a $60,000 rental loan. I know you've already paid hundred grand for the house, $60 rental, it's worth 250, great. I'll do a construction loan and we'll go. Pretty easy for us. Um, the other avenue, which is acquisition and construction. And so we, we escrow the construction money or essentially, or we hold it for disbursement. So if you need 60 grand in disbursements, what we do now is as you complete the project in phases, you can set the phases how you want with us. Um, each time there's a phase complete, our inspector comes out, looks at the property, goes pictures, 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 looks good. Great, wired 10,000 in, we just wired in that day. That's more traditional in terms of the, the draw schedules that we um, bump into, but we do 100% of the construction. And the reason we do this the way we do it or any uh, just inside uh, information for lending is that, so we base our values on the end value. So if I gave you the entire construction budget today, and my maximum exposure is say 65% of the repaired value. If I'm at that number day one and the house hasn't been brought up to speed, it means I'm way over leveraged. It means I wanted to be at that number when it was completed, not when it starts. So if I give you the whole construction budget up front and then you go ahead and get hit by a bus, God forbid, I am now exposed on this deal for way more than I wanted to. So we do it in, uh, and most, almost every company you're gonna bump into is gonna do it in draws for that reason. It protects exposure to make sure the work is being completed and you can just take the money and go and buy a Maserati with it. I know a guy that did that. Um, well, you're paying less, I mean, you're paying the interest as you do, as you draw it. No, you're paying interest on the whole thing, yeah. So if, if you're a $100,000 loan for construction and renovation, you're paying on the 100 grand, whether it's in your pocket or not. So what's the best way to, to potentially evaluate something? Let's say I bought something to, you know, to you guys. Is it something that initiates through your website or is it directly to you? Like what's the best, most efficient way and, and really to get an answer quick? Yeah, so the reality, so the reality of how it works is we have um, our, my, my partner's office where all the fun stuff happens behind the scenes is uh, Maryland. Um, I live here in the Eastern PA area um, my, my, my other partner in Northern Jersey does Northern Jersey and Delaware, but our hub is in Maryland, in uh, Columbia, Maryland. And that's where like we have our processing and our accounting and so forth. Um, so I'm just giving you a visual logistic of how that goes. You're going to go to our site, you fill out an application and it's just going to come right to me. My partner will just probably have 40 me the, the application. So it's gonna come to me. I do the underwriting up here. I don't have, um, like other, nobody else underwrites. Underwriting is the most important part of our business, meaning like we make the decision on if the money goes out or stays in, we cannot outsource that. So um, basically what'll happen is it goes to our website and then it comes to me. Great, you can do it that way, or you can just email me because <laughs> either way it's coming, it's gonna go directly to me. So it, it doesn't really matter what you wanna do. I'd say the easiest, fastest way to do it typically is most people just email me directly and they literally, all they send is address renovation costs and how much they're paying for a property. If I have those three things, short email, I usually have an answer. If I'm not doing a presentation or something, I'll have an answer for you within an hour. And then um, that's how I can close the next day if we like it, but that's it, it's, it's that clean. So in an agreement of sale, I'm sorry, in an agreement of sale, do you, do you put in that it's being financed or that it's a cash transaction? So depends who you're working with. Um, the savvier sellers, um, some, of the, some of the websites where you, you know, the auction type websites and so forth is usually where you're kind of running into that. Um, most people, I don't know, 50, 50 actually with my clients, some of them put cash some of them put financing. Most of the, um, the savvier sellers will not care because they realize that you're like a good hard money lender is the same as cash. So there's just as fast It's the same thing. The ones that don't really understand hard money are going to make you, they're going to, you're going to tie up the contract, which is fine. And then they're going to go, you need to resubmit as cash. So, you can do whatever you want. I can tell you, I've never, I've done a lot of deals with 
a lot of those websites. And um, we've never had a deal fall out because you submitted as cash and then we they, they wanted to resubmit as financing. Um, so it's always worked out. It just sometimes causes maybe a few days delay and they you know throw a hissy fit, but it's never not worked out. So, But generally, like if it was a seller who was a private individual, who would put cash? They won't care. They won't know or care. Would it be it, represented by an agent? Um, yeah, you could do it either way because it is cash. Um, you could because essentially I could wire the money in, and after the closing, I could I could record the note. If you if, like, if we really wanted to explain it to somebody in that capacity, I see both. Is my answer? I guess that I see people do it as both. Sometimes it comes up when it's like with the bigger sites, the bigger um, auction sites, where but most of the time it's just like they didn't care to begin with whether you submit as cash or financing. I can tell you, the sexier, easier way to secure the deal is you submit it as cash. And then as long as my money shows up, nobody cares. Um, that's what I find a lot. I mean, trick of the trade. A lot of the guys that, and girls that I work with on the, those sites will typically submit as cash, knowing that it, like to see if it has any extra weight as opposed to having to explain financing or something. Um, I don't know if it actually has any kind of impact. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. They're just not leaving anything to chance. So does that answer your question? Okay. You said there's three criteria when getting the loan. One is a clear title. And the other two are? Uh, for me, a loan from us? Um, so I'm usually just asking for address, renovation costs, and how much property um, costs to buy. And, and then, yeah, I have to have clear title. The next, you know, as soon as the title's in, we're always good to go. That's do, it. Uh, do you use uh, cash as collateral? No, we don't use cash as collateral. Um, it's got to be an a-, a real estate asset. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. Do you guys have any other questions that I can? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, say I find, I find a nice home, everything goes well. I'll settle in 90 days. I have financing with you. Uh, when we settle, uh, how much uh, interest do I owe in settlement? At settlement? No, I don't. We don't require any reserves up front. We don't do that uh, unless you want to build in payments or something, but we don't require that. Some companies require that. We just, I always look at it and go, you're either going to show up or you're not with the money. I mean, that's when I'm ready to pay the payoff, you. Oh, so the monthly payments are, it's interest only. So the monthly payments are our compensation, so to say, for the money being lent out there. But at the time that your loan has to close out, as long as your loan was in good standing, there's no like late fees or anything. You would So if you borrowed 100, you pay 100. Um, when you balloon out, but you've already, but let's say it took you six months, you probably made six or seven thousand dollars in interest only payments against that hundred grand already. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? You guys want to hear? I'm trying to figure out renovation cost for submitting it. Do you want some kind of substantiation from a GC or? It's a good question. Something you know. I can bring in a designer who's done work in New York. No, 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 no. I don't want to send you, th- send you through all that. Um, so my answer is I've just, I've done so many deals that I know about where the construction numbers should be. So I don't bust your chops over, you know, if you, if you go to tell me in South Philly, you're going to do one of those houses that resells at 230, two story, it's going to resell at 230, 225. The renovation costs for there are properly done are 60 to $80,000. That's it. So if you go on three story, it's 110 to 150, depending on really what you're doing. But if you all of a sudden come in and go, hey, it's going to cost $15,000 to do this renovation, I'm going to say no chance. So it's a huge red flag. When you're approaching a hard money lender, I'll tell you, it's a, you know, a private lender. The reason I can tell so quickly about like if we really want to do a deal or not, or if I have to probe a little further is based on your numbers. So when you come in and you go, hey, you know, renovation costs are this, and I know it's 60 to 80 just from experience and you go 15, I go red flag. You don't know what you're doing. Either you don't know how to manage construction or you just aren't paying any respect to the situation at hand. Um, two, next thing that comes in is the acquisition price. I look at this and go, oh, that house that you're buying there, you should be buying between 60 and $75,000. Um, you're about 30% give or take of the um, ARV is a good deal. So I know you should be between like 60 and 75%. Well, let's say you're paying like 140 and you think it's 15,000 at work, but you're really gonna be 140 on 80. So you're done, you're just, you're just lost. So like, I know right away if you're overpaying, meaning how, how, what your ability to execute is and how well you've um, done your research in the area. 
So like those numbers to me are extremely important. So I don't need that initially after we go, like after we go, Hey, you know, you're at 65. I'm like, it could be 60. It could be 70. I don't know. Like whatever your contractor could do it cheaper than the next guy. As long as you're within that 60, $80,000 range in that area, it means that you've put the time in to understand what it costs to fully renovate this. As we go into closing, you will then send over a scope of work byline. I mean, like, okay, you know, phase one, $10,000 get you know, uh, we're gutting the property and we're roughing it, right? Next phase is drywall and paint, whatever. So that's where the byline items come in, but we don't, we're don't. we not overly sticklers about that. Where we, where I do get concerned is obviously if it's too light, I'm just like, I can't, you're gonna get killed here. And then also if it's too heavy, if I'm like, you know, that 60, $80,000 you're leaving is a two story and you're gonna be putting $175,000 into it. I'm like, that stinks like a rebuild to me, meaning you're going to knock it down and build it back up. You know, so there's certain things like that that'll trigger. So I like to know why, you know, or maybe there's, I don't know, maybe there's an oil tank in the ground that you had to deal with remediation or something. That's possible. It's okay. I just need to know when we're outside of those ranges of what I'm comfortable with or know fairly well why it's there. Um, high side is more excusable if there's a valid reason. Low side is just screams inexperience. Well, let's say for instance, there was something in, you know, a higher end neighborhood. Yeah. The property is, you know, realistically around $700,000 as is. Yeah. And could potentially sell for about a 1.2. Needs a, just, the bones are good, the systems are good, but everything else needs to be replaced. New bathrooms, new kitchen, new floor material. Quarter million dollars. Sorry? Quarter million dollar. Which is what we were looking at, yeah. yeah. So, um, but that would fit into kind of the scope of things that you could Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Gonna have to be a little bit expensive for sure yeah i mean i always look at it like if you just like break it down to like the um what it is right so i always use instead of a house use a car like removes anybody that's in the business away from like that mindset so like if you have a car that you're gonna buy you have a mercedes here and you have um, the same exact mercedes you know this one's been on a lot for three months this one's been driven for three months which one are you gonna pay like the most for you're going to pay the one that's never been driven before the one that's never been used the one that doesn't have a slightly used system a slightly used that well if that that number is what you're trying to achieve to to get that brand new mercedes you can't expect to get that same number from the one that's even slightly used so like i'm not saying the systems are whatever but, but a lot of times people are like i can keep this i can save that i can keep save that when the when the buyer comes in and goes i can buy the same house right here brand new everything's new why would i pay same amount for the house that's right here. Now there's supply and demand and certain things like that, certain areas that are super hot. I think we hit the top of the market in 2017, so I'm not sure if there's there. I don't need to get around that argument with regards to systems, just using a home warranty because they'll replace something that's faulty. You could, you could, depending on the supply and demand in the area, right? So in the event that there's five of these houses sitting on the market and everything, four of them have been completely gutted, I'm, yours is now on the back of the list. But in the event that you're in an area that's like, as soon as something comes on the market, we got to get on this. There's areas like that. I mean, there's that, that happens too. So supply and demand gets a little more tricky. I just usually tell people, you know, if you're trying to achieve that top number, if your comp is based on that top number, understand exactly what went into that house to achieve it. Because like you could also still make money on the, on the house you're saying, but you have to under uh, reset your expectations of this might sell a little bit lower. What, what I was giving you that figure is yeah. actually about $200,000 that we're there you go. Comp that was substantially nice. New construction or something. Yeah. So, so you comp, yeah, you compensate for it um, accurately. So you make sure you're in the right um, mindset going in. I, I see one of the biggest mistakes I see typically are like people trying to save a few things, comparing it to a new construction. The other thing, I, the other big mistake I see when people do comps is they do it too far away. You're inside this city, you are like on the block. Um, and first thing I'm looking for is on the block. And if I have to go outside the block, I'm like, any major road I have to crawl, anything. Can I see the house still from where I am? Because if you don't have enough, like there's enough inventory where you should have enough data. If you don't have enough data, it means why, what's not selling. You go into the suburbs, you know, you're probably a quarter mile, but you better be in the same same subdivision. Um, but like geography is huge. Um, especially if I'm doing a $1.2 million deal or something, I'm like, I better be able to smell the house that's sold next to it. like. Big time because I don't want to. You go too far. How do you manage that? I mean, I've noticed people living in their houses 10, 20, 30 years in this region are not just moving every five years. As a, lend as a lender? I'm sorry? How do I manage that as a lender? 
I guess, I mean, you know, it's kind of just people, especially in the suburbs, they linger. Yeah, yeah, no, there are areas of the city that do that for sure. Um, I just, I always say, I'm not always right, but I can't be on the wrong side of wrong. Meaning if I'm unsure, and this is just a lot of like instinct, but if I'm unsure, my number's not going up, it's going down in the amount that I'll lend. And I'll offset my risk by having you bring more money in it. So I'll just, I'll just say like, I'll, I'll be upfront, I'm, just, I'm not comfortable with the deal. Like, like there's a, as soon as you get into the realm of speculative buying, meaning like you have people that have been here for 30 years, Where's the data to tell us what this house is really worth? Because you could say it's worth 1.4 because you think it'll be worth 1.4, but what is justifying that number? And maybe you do get it. Maybe you're the guy that gets that number. I don't know, but I can't be on the side of speculative speculation. I can only be on the side of like the data that's in front of me. So instead of me going like, Hey, yeah, let's push our margins here at like 700,000. I might be like 500 grand and you're bringing 500 to the table. You want to do it? Let's go. Um, and that's my way of saying it. I'm scared. I'm a baby, whatever you want to put it in there as. Um, but if I have like comp here, comp here, you know, I looked at one this morning that was like the range was three. There was like six comps on the street, 315 to 330. I was like, it doesn't get any easier than this. I could tell you like to the penny what this thing's going to cost. So I'm going to be very comfortable with that. Um, but I run into that stuff. I have we have one out in. Uh, in the suburbs, it was a 10,000 square foot house with like horse barn and all this stuff. And I'm like, what do I do with this thing? And uh, I was like, I know there's value here. I know there's real value. Um, but now it's going to 10,000 square feet. There's nothing else. So I'm like, you're going to be based on like a 6,000 square foot number. And if you really still want to come to the table on those numbers, that's up to you. They did. Um, but like, you know, you get that white elephant factor that you just don't know. And so I don't have a hard answer there for you. It's just more of like a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you kind of see where my my mind goes with that. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. What else? Nothing. You guys, know it. Good to go. Is this something that people you know who are just starting out with you know, renovations who don't have a lot of cash on hand? Is this the type of thing that would work for them at all, or do you really need people to to have a good amount of cash? Uh, I think it depends on. It's all relative, right? So um, a pretty common amount of liquidity like to, to do this right is on most deals, depending on what kind of deal you're doing, but between like 30 and 50 grand, like liquid is safe. It doesn't mean you're bringing all that to the table. It just means you want to be, you know, 30 to 50 grand in a bank account. Um, when I see a lot of times I see different kinds of partnerships form. So like one person might not have a lot of liquidity, somebody else does, but they don't want to get involved in the business. They don't want to, they don't want to do the construction. They don't want to source the properties. So I see a lot of joint, like, like, you know, you two would partner up in an LLC. Your job is the money. Your job is the source, the property and construction. You form the LLC, we lend to the LLC. Um, and then you guys have your operating agreement where you split it. So I see that pretty frequently, pretty common, um, when you're trying to gap that. Honestly, though. The skill is the person with the property. It's not hard, hard to find uh, somebody that's got some money that wants to partner with you. The real skill in this business is the person that can find the property at the right deal. I always tell people, like, I see, you know, 30 deals a day and you'd be like, wow, you must be doing so many deals. I'm like, no, I try to do one a day. And the reason is 29 of them aren't deals. Like, you know, give or take some uh, bit of range there. But like most deals are not deals. They're just not. They're not. You know, people think they're worth a lot more than they are. So if you find somebody, I, I know a few people that are really, they just have like an eye for good deals. I'm like, how do you come across this? And if it's a wholesaler or private or MLS, whatever, um, you really just, that is the biggest asset I find in this business is uh, people that can spot good deals because the money will find you if you have a good deal, for sure. Yeah. You a lot of people that are all spot auctions. Yeah, all the time. Uh, like the physical auction or the auction sites? Yeah, sure. Share sale. So um, we are one of the, well, as far as I know, we're the only lender that can do sheriff sales. And there's a, it's very specific. So sheriff sales, not tax sales. Tax sales have a right of redemption period of nine months and we can't get clear title. So we can't do that until after the redemption period. The sheriff sale, the foreclosure sale, we can do because um, there's a title policy that'll be issued to us. So what happens is you, you win the bid at sheriff sale and then you have to come do with the money within 30 days. Well, you give the money to the sheriff, but they don't record that deed for two more months um, in Philadelphia, at least in some other 
So that lapse between when you gave the money over and when the deed is actually recording, technically the sheriff's department could have missed something and it happens, you know, whether it's a water lien or whatever it was, and that pops back up. Well, the title company wants to go to you, sorry, you know, no, no bueno. Um, we do have some title companies, there's two or three in the area. As long as you specifically work with them, they will give us the lender's policy we need to cover us during that gap because they're experienced enough in this business to know like, there's very few things that can pop up here um, but that's usually with a more experienced title company. So yes, we can. Um, but, and it's, you know, we're the only lender in the game that does it because it's just too complicated for somebody that's like institutionally backed or something. They're just like, we're not getting into it. Um, it's a different, different type of buyer too. You can't get in the house. You can't like, you, so they can't do an appraisal officially. So we'll do a drive by appraisal on it, that kind of stuff.